Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to a conversation on the future and trends of automobiles. Joining me in the conversation is Dr. Zach Darsoff, Executive Director of Virginia Tech's Transportation Institute, and thanks so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. You know, um, I also noticed that you're um, not only the new Executive Director of the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, but you're also Director of the Center for Advanced Automotive Research and of course, associate professor at the Institute. Could you perhaps give us a kind of an orientation, a little about history, mission, and task in, uh, in terms of the Institute? Sure, absolutely. Well, first thing it may be important to realize is I've only been here just shy of a year, so this role is new for me. On the other hand, I've been at Virginia Tech Transportation Institute and the payroll of Virginia Tech for 21 years. So <laughs> the, uh, the area of mobility is not new for me. And in fact, I take it all the way back to my childhood and, and just have always been fascinated by the way that things move. Um, built my first car when I was 14, for example, from the ground up. So wow. uh, go-karts before that, various race cars afterwards, just always been fascinated by the way things move. Um, and, you know, a little, little later than that, I, I was really intrigued by a secondary thing and when I got to, to undergraduate college and, and that's kind of human factors which is the human side of of engineering so we take mobility mix in a little technology and then think about human factors and what we end up with is sort of how I got to where I am which is uh, bringing together the nexus of mobility uh, how do we solve the challenges by thinking through how do we best serve the human through technology and advancements and really finding the magic fit between the human role and technology role in, in transportation um, now we'll take that forward and think about what that means for the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Well, um, you know, we start from a basis of uh, recognizing that we have a variety of some of the biggest challenges in the country that are associated with how we move people and goods. Uh, we also start from the framework of technology is phenomenal. It's advanced so rapidly that we believe the future mobility really is here today. And, and you can see it. Uh, we have things like automated vehicles that are starting to hit the roadways, electric vehicles which are taking off, a variety of other technologies and connectivity which is really changing the way we think about mobility. It's no longer just a vehicle, we have micro transit, we have various other modes that we're starting to figure out how to create more of a seamless uh, transportation mobility experience. The flip side of that is we also recognize that we have a whole lot left to do in front of us. Um, arguably, we have more in front of us than behind us because we believe that the next 10 years may transform mobility in a way that we haven't seen in the last 100 years since really the invention of the automobile. So we're very excited to be part of that, but you can see the challenges, things like uh, businesses being acquired and transferred regularly now. You can see uh, you know, startup companies with brand new ideas. Some are making it, some are not. It's just a lot of movement in the industry, and that's really because of the realization that some of these challenges are extremely difficult, whether that's the business case underneath it, legislation that needs to, to be there to support new technologies, or various other challenges that have to do with really integrating next generation of mobility kind of technology and solutions into the transportation systems of today. That's a wonderful 40,000 foot uh, overview. And there's some things that it seems to really be moving very quickly. Um, I bought a, a new car in 2021. It had been five years or so since I had a new car. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised I had adaptive cruise control, but wow, I mean, even the improvement, especially in terms of safety, I've been impressed. And I guess everything we're seeing now is a tremendous push. Let's talk a little bit about the um, electric cars. Um, I saw one stat that said today there's only about 4% of, uh, of the automobiles sold that are electric, but 42% of American population and drivers says, oh, I will seriously consider getting um, an electric uh, car. And by 2030, one estimate I saw said the majority of our cars would be electric. So it seems like right now that is right here with us. It, it's very exciting, yes. Um, and it's not new. It feels new to a lot of us, but uh, believe it or not, electric vehicles date all the way back to the 1800s. So there's, there was the idea that you know, internal combustion wasn't the only way to sort of move these you know, people around. But um, what has happened really is technology has brought it to the point where it is a viable solution for most people in terms of their transportation needs. And that, that really wasn't the case until very recently here, which is why it's taking some time to build up the momentum. You know, if you're a company and you need to keep your shareholders happy, you know, you, you can tolerate some risk, but you have to have a product that people want. And what you're seeing is the shift from, you know, 
10 years ago where very few people saw themselves in an electric vehicle to today where, as you said, over 40% of individuals really can start to see where they would fit into the electric um, vehicle space. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with exposure, you know, in addition to the, the underlying technologies like battery storage solutions coming on board and electric powertrains really starting to, to show where they would fit in was just there weren't many electric car examples out there to look at and understand and see, and that created things like range, range anxiety. It um, kept individuals from wanting to invest in what is often the first or second largest you know, expense in the household right. uh, on something they were not sure whether or not would work for them. So I'm assuming that really, the, uh, not the key, because it's more complex than we really, especially when we're looking at some of the, the articles uh, about it, but it was about the battery, right? I mean, in other words, the more efficient, the more storage, batteries smaller. So in other words, I guess that is one of the batteries itself was a key uh, part of making it viable. Uh, absolutely, yeah. The battery, battery storage, ability to charge it fast enough to be viable. You know, if you can't charge it overnight, you're certainly not going to be able to use it the next day. We're all used to pulling up to a gas pump and 30 seconds later, we've got another three or 400 miles to travel. Electric vehicles haven't gotten to that point yet. You know, there are potential pathways to get us shorter and shorter charge times. But even as today, when we start talking about rapid charging and, and getting hundreds of miles in 30 minutes or less, that becomes, you know, for most of us who only travel, travel 10, 20 miles a day, that's plenty of excess capacity. Even allows us to take some short road trips without concerns of charging. Well, see, that's, now, now that's my biggest fear. Um, I don't know where these stations are um, charging, and, and for the long trips, that's where it, it kind of, uh, one of my particular concerns. Um, is, it, or is it more efficient? Is it less expensive overall in terms of operation? Um, or is this really a way of not only some efficiencies for smaller transportation in terms of distance, but also in terms of the environment. Yeah, all the above. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it really can no, be cheaper. There, there is, a, absolutely. Um, and a lot of that depends on your local energy costs and whatnot. But in general, especially with today's fuel costs, <laughs> yes, it's going to be cheaper on a per mile basis. Um, and these are new technologies. There's going to be better vehicles than some others. But in general, the things like the maintenance requirements for an electric vehicle are going to be cheaper than an internal combustion engine. Um, so you get some additional cost savings potential there. To your point on on charging systems, you know, the good news is that thanks to geolocation technologies and, and infotainments within vehicles these days, you know, a lot of cars will tell you where the next charging station is and they'll help tell you even your, you know, your current range won't get you to your destination, but there's a charger or two on the way. Would you like to stop and charge? And then it'll even say for how many minutes you should charge in order to make it the rest of the way. So you've got some technology which helps to facilitate the limitations of sort of the electric powertrain they are there to help. Of course, we're also in the midst of deploying uh, fairly rapidly, depending on the region, more charging infrastructure. So some of those concerns will be alleviated by just an increase in the availability of, of chargers that are, are fast. And that should have shows the naivete in terms of the, of course they should be able to tell me where they are. Did, um, well, let's, let's move to the uh, driverless cars, the autonomous cars. Again, I have to say with the adaptive cruise control, what surprised me on the new one is that it does kind of keep me in the lane. Uh -huh. um, now, you can't take your hands off because then it'll say, put your hands back on the, okay, okay. But I'm surprised. Um, how close are we really there um, in terms of driverless cars? That's a great question. I think your, your intro is particularly good because you, you sort of leaned into that it's not actually a binary question. It's not, it's not traditional driving to fully automated. There's really a continuum of automated technologies that help to sort of transition us from manual to automated. Uh, but they also provide us with a lot of additional capabilities that we haven't had in the past. So you've experienced adaptive cruise control, as you said. When you're talking about steering, you've got some sort of lane centering or lane keeping technology, which is an automation of steering, but it's there to assist you rather than to replace you. 
And we've got some time probably in this phase where, where we can slide that needle back and forth from just a little bit of assistance where the human's mostly driving to a lot of assistance. And it's a little bit tricky as we get over this hump because as the robot driver takes more of the driving task from the human, as humans naturally do, we might start to have vigilance issues, we may engage in distractions, and then when, the, when something arises out there in the world that needs our attention, we may not be ready to take over. And that is a difficult hump to get over because uh, you know, as transportation safety experts, the last thing we want to do in this process is make driving more dangerous. The whole purpose is to fundamentally improve transportation, particularly from a safety viewpoint. So we've got this little tricky phase we're in, which some will argue we're going to skip. So we're going to do what you're used to, which we call level two automated. That means you get a little steering help and a little throttle help. We're going to skip level three, which is when you get to start to sort of disengage, but you're still responsible to take over in certain situations, and we may go all the way to level four. Level four is, now you can really disengage, the robot's the primary driver. So that's really kind of the switch that's happening uh, over those points. Others believe we gotta get through the, all of the lessons learned in level three before we can go to four. So sort of depending on which you prescribe to sets the timeline, and that's further confounded by what kind of mobility are we talking about? So there are different challenges associated with different problems. And the reason I try to tease out some of those nuances is I don't foresee there being a point where we just suddenly have lots of automation everywhere. Rather, specific market segments are likely to be sort of early adopters based on things like the business case underneath that particular uh, modality. And I'll give you an example. So let's take heavy tractor trailers. These are the large vehicles over the road, spend most of their time on the highways, drive hundreds, thousand miles a year, right? All on the road all the time. If you think about that particular segment, you know, there's, they're spending most of the time on the highway. Highway's a pretty simple environment in terms of the amount of clutter, pedestrians, all those things that we get in urban environments are, are not as difficult once you're on an interstate. In addition, because it's trucking, those, you can have a truck that drives more often. You can provide uh, brakes to a human driver. So the human may drive in the delivery locations out in the ends, but maybe an automation takes over just from a hub to hub on the interstate. And then the business case suddenly becomes very clear for cases like that, which means you can have a vehicle that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and it makes sense. Whereas you as an individual citizen probably are not interested in A, having a car that's that expensive, that needs all of that maintenance and upkeep to keep these advanced sensors operating just to have it sit in your garage most of the time. So some, I think we'll see, you know, in the next five, 10 years, we'll see an increasing amount in certain markets like trucking, maybe inside of urban environments with sort of taxis and that sort of thing, but uh, less so probably for individuals. And, and ultimately, I like to say that for all practical purposes, human driving's here to stay. And we shouldn't even be thinking like, everything's gonna be automated because, uh, you know, you drive a classic Mustang or, a, you know, you're just a <laughs> motorcycle rider. You know, there's just too many reasons. The, the rancher who's got to get, you know, take his vehicle across the field and through that mud bog to go pick up the, you know, piece of equipment that's stuck. There's lots of reasons to retain human driving for the foreseeable future. You know, my, my daughter-in-law was a philosophy major. Oh. And she got a master's in philosophy. And one of the things in the senior kind of class was they were looking at, okay, if you're approaching a deer, mm -hmm. is it ethical? And her specialty was ethics and medical ethics. Mm -hmm. But in this particular class and what they were working with the RAND Corporation was, if you go deer, is it better to hit the deer? Do you dodge the deer? In other words, a decision tree. And I thought, my goodness, you, you can get a job with a philosophy degree. <laughs> you know. So it, 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 it's kind of funny. But it's that level we don't even think about. But clearly there has to be some also rationale or decision points, how to stop, how close to fall, all those kinds of things. Absolutely, yeah. We refer to what you described as the trolley problem. It's one of many fascinating thought experiments that we try to do to understand, well, in all of these basically limitless potential situations that you find yourself in as a driver, if you replace the human with the automated technology, what, what would you program it to do. And, uh, and often it's not that explicit because you clearly can't explicitly program every possible thing that we encounter in, in driving. Uh, but there are still rules uh, that we put underneath all those algorithms and technologies that will most, you know, create more likely outcomes. And it's things like choosing between, you know, two different bad outcomes if that's all 
that's available to you um, and the extent to which it's realistic to assume that sensors and robots can even make those kind of complex decisions is debatable by itself. Well, safety is one of the greatest concerns, but what I appreciate what you said is that there's no such thing where if you want to go to the middle of some rural area and road in terms of automation, there, there's going to always be the need for some sort of human interaction in terms of that. In certain situations. One thing that strikes me um, is what I did not realize was such related science technologies related to the transportation in the automobile. For example, obviously artificial uh, intelligence, big data analytics, 3D printing. I thought, well, now what does 3D printing have to do with it? But there's a whole lot of technologies that's involved that are, um, have disciplines themselves. Absolutely. And yeah. I was surprised to see the numbers from there because it's not intuitive. Like, well, what's I got to do with driving? Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> and I mean, you can even, we could, we could talk about enabling technologies all day, but um, you know, with the chip shortage is a good example. Vehicles are really just computers on wheels these days and they're more sophisticated by far, by far, or as a magnitude than say the space shuttle was. So when you really kind of put it into perspective, these are uh, bordering on supercomputers on wheels when we talk about things like automated vehicles. Um, connectivity is another example. So, you know, whether that's, if you look at most higher tech kind of late model vehicles, they are connected in some way to something so that they can do things like remotely update their software packages. And that's real exciting because there was, you know, not that long ago when you bought a car, it was the way you bought it until the day it died. <laughs> But now you can get over the air updates and have whole new software experiences, whether that's through your infotainment system or they're actually capable uh, in many platforms of changing the way that the, the vehicle operates in order to improve the automated system over time or make the vehicle more efficient when they learn, you know, how to make some adjustments to the powertrain. So there's, there's no longer, the vehicle you buy is no longer the vehicle you may one day sell later on, but rather it may evolve with you over time. Well, this may be beyond some of the technology um, uh, discussions, but I, I worry about the supply train. I worry about China. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like, do we even have the infrastructure here, or is that just another political and governmental concern that needs to be addressed in the future? I think there, that's a very reasonable question, one that needs to be carefully thought through, and there are efforts like the CHIPS Act, which are are working towards having some of that production capability brought domestically, certainly in today's world with a rather turbulent times we're in in some ways, I think it's a good time to return to what, to the thinking of what should be domestic and, and maybe what can be supported internationally. Um, you know, there's some other really exciting legislation in, in our space too. For example, you have the, the unprecedentedly, you know, expansive um, uh, Infrastructure Act, which is really gonna help solve some of our issues in transportation with things like the crumbling infrastructure. Um, you know, you pair that with a forthcoming uh, Inflation Reduction Act and we really have some, a neat pool of resources to tie back to some of what you're talking about with electrification. You know, our grid could use some updating so we can think through how do we bring the sort of electric capacity and resilience that we need to enable broad adoption of electric vehicles. Um, where does hydrogen fit into that equation? So there's a lot of, there's a neat investment going on in the public space to really accelerate the technologies that will bring around uh, solutions to our mobility challenges here in the future. One of the things that strikes me if we go f f far enough down that you can have such personalization of the automobile based upon your age or perhaps a disability or what have you. Are there fairly generational differences in expectations as it relates, or is there pretty general agreement as it relates to electric cars, driverless cars, and those kinds? Are, are there generational differences? There, there are some willingness to accept technology differences. Um, <laughs> You know, anecdotally, I would say that was more pronounced. I think uh, a larger portion of the population is getting enough experience now to see some of the advantages. But um, yeah, we have a, we tend to see a larger willingness to adopt in younger populations when it comes to some of the higher technology. And, and to be, you know, critical of, our, of my own industry, I, I have to say some of the technology like you may or may not have experienced in your, uh, you know, what your vehicles have, sometimes they're, 
a bit convoluted in, in how their use is. They're not well described to the owner of the vehicle. They can't even be surprising at times. And then you have very different implementations, which means the experiences you go from one car to another, perhaps as a rental or a new purchase, is changing sometimes radically from one to the next. So you know, we have some concerns about what that may mean in terms of uh, negative transfer of knowledge. So you're you bring in expectations that you built in one car into another car and it doesn't operate the same and that can create some potential risks and challenges that we're just starting to deal with as these systems really start to become more available. I'm going to make a confession. Uh oh. So the last two cars, it'll, they say it'll park itself. Mm -hmm. I, I thought, I went and I practiced a little bit. Oh, it scares me too much and if they're too close in, I have never let the car park itself for six or eight years, it just, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't trust it, I don't. And, and so there is an example of what you were saying that myself, I, I, just, I just ignore that whole thing. That is a good example, yeah. And, and I mean, uh, that's great that you, get to, you can choose not to use it, right? So it's there and somebody else is using it, <laughs> so. Well, I would love to be able to. I just, it, 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 it takes um, a little bit more practice perhaps yeah. with that parallel parking. It does, uh, well, and we'll call it trust in automation because you know you're a good parallel parker. You don't trust the automated system to park as good as you can. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That I suppose remains to be seen. You'd have to, yeah, we'd have to run an experiment with you and see. Oh my gosh, it. well I'll be out there tomorrow morning on your, on your, on your facility. Well, we, we have four minutes or so remaining. Um, what would you say are the main challenges is it mass transit too is another big one that we hadn't even mentioned that the possibility of actually helping in that. It's not just rail, but mm -hmm. the technology itself can help us in terms of mass transit and what have you. It, it can, yeah. And I think, I think that's a very good thread to pull on because mass transit is a phenomenal um, mode of transportation. It's really good for improving access to individuals if it's well deployed. It is very inexpensive relative to single occupant vehicles because one vehicle is holding a number of individuals. Um, there are real challenges with it when we think about how do you get an individual to their particular destination or, or origin um, with mass transit in, a, in an effective way. And we, we call that the last mile problem. It's really challenging. Mm solutions are forthcoming um, you know things like micro mobility can help that would be scooters for example or electric bicycles deployed um, smaller modes of transportation that can take you from you know a, a bus depot to, to uh, bus stops that are closer to people's residence so a lot of that has to do with how do we integrate different modes of transportation together to create a seamless mobility um, experience for the individuals and it's a it's a big challenge because you have lots of different companies and organizations, public side, private side. So how do you get all of these individuals, or really organizations, to talk together in a way that does create a great experience for the user? That's an upcoming, I think, real opportunity for us as, a, as an industry to solve. And, and strides are being made. And it seems to me that there, it, when we talk about safety is always forefront there, accessibility. And part of accessibility is also affordability. And there is some concern that there are some people who would not even be able to avail themselves to the technologies. And what I'm so convinced now is that someone like me who is not as young as I used to be, it helps me to be safer on the road. Mm -hmm. And so what would you see as the largest uh, challenges? We have about two minutes left. I'd be curious to say, okay, yeah. that last mile, What? is the future in any time frame you'd like to share yeah i mean in, in the i would i would i absolutely first and foremost agree that accessibility should be at the at the onset of our minds and it is a big challenge because these are expensive systems by their very nature so you know there is the belief well we'll start to put them on expensive vehicles and they're trickle down and eventually they'll be readily available on lots of vehicles and that's not wrong i mean we're seeing it today there's the technology you talked about are all the way down on some base vehicles now but they're not as good as the advanced vehicle um, and that's really where it comes into the public investment. It comes into transit. It perhaps hits points like, uh, how do we get people who don't traditionally have good access, access to vehicles because we lean into systems like shared mobility, where they don't have to burden the cost of vehicle ownership, but they still have access to transportation on demand as they need it, which things like apps on our phone and technology are helping to provide us 
with. We're not all the way there yet. I mean, we've seen transformational shifts in terms of the availability of ride on demand, you know, from from various parts and in industry, from large companies like Uber or Lyft down to smaller organizations which are targeting more of the vulnerable or, or higher need populations. So there's there's traction, but I think to truly create a an equitable, accessible environment, we have a lot more work to do. Well, I very much appreciate you being with us. That's all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Zach Dorzoff, and I want to thank you for joining us and hope you will do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.